This is Dr. Stancil with a lecture called Whistleblowing and the Moral Theories. In this lecture, I'll look at whistleblowing as a phenomenon through four of the most common moral theories used in Western ethics. First of all, what is whistleblowing? It is the public disclosure of misdeeds of an organization by someone internal to the organization. Uh, this may be done for the sake of the public good to avert some harm or um, to reduce some risk that the misdeeds are causing or could cause. Um, this also could be done just for morality's sake because it's the right thing to do. Um, it, uh, the whistleblower may have been complicit in the wrongdoing, and um, they may not have been. It's actually um, quite hard to characterize whistleblowing with a brief definition because um, it can involve so, such a variety of factors. Um, but what, what all cases of whistleblowing have in common, which is really relevant to us in an ethics, in an ethics class, is that the whistleblower, uh, and whether this was right or wrong, has prioritized their sense of duty to the public over their sense of duty to their colleagues, to the organization, and even to themselves. Because as it turns out, unfortunately, it is very common for a whistleblower to suffer retaliation in some form or forms. In this lecture, I'll be looking at whistleblowing in a very general way from the perspectives of four common moral theories, utilitarianism, virtue ethics, Kantianism, and social contract theory. And I have put them in this order, um, not because this is the order in which they emerged historically, because it's not, um, but because we will see that uh, utilitarianism has the simplest and least difficult perspective on whistleblowing, and the other ones can be um, a little more difficult. According to ACT Utilitarianism, what a moral agent should do in any given situation is whatever will promote greatest overall happiness for everyone involved in that situation. And thus this theory is called situationalist because it doesn't promote any absolute or forever universal moral rules, rather it holds we must make moral decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. The act utilitarian will have a, a pretty simple answer for a person who is asking, should I blow the whistle or not? The act utilitarian will say, do whatever will most likely bring greatest overall happiness when you consider all who are involved in this situation. And with that as guidance, now it becomes a matter of the potential whistleblower doing enough research to try to determine how much overall happiness is likely to be produced by them blowing the whistle and how much is likely to, pr to be produced by them remaining quiet or exploring other avenues. Um, now, in real life, this won't be a simple matter. It still could be quite difficult for someone to make that decision to um, publicly disclose wrongdoing by their organization. But theoretically, this is a simple answer. Um, rule utilitarianism holds that we all should follow moral rules, which, if universally followed, would produce the greatest overall happiness. And so a rule utilitarian is going to have to uh, consider moral rules related to, to whistleblowing. And this would be a rule that, for example, um, if wrongdoing is occurring in an organization and its consequences are significant or 
could be quite significant for the public, uh, then a person should report that wrongdoing. And um, our culture, <clears throat> excuse me, really seems to endorse this as a moral law. And I think most rural utilitarians would also. When it comes to Immanuel Kant's moral theory, it's much more difficult of an answer. Um, Kant is known to be an absolutist, which means that he holds that there are universal moral laws which are binding on all of us under all circumstances. Uh, Kant's system it has a very hard time handling conflicting duties. And someone who is in the position to potentially be a whistleblower is someone who in most cases is facing a conflict of duties. On the one hand, they um, may have a confidentiality agreement with their employer. They may have duties of loyalty to their colleagues and to their organization. Um, on the other hand, they have a duty to protect the public from risk or from harm. And when these duties conflict, Kant's absolutist system is going to have a hard time giving that person a sense of direction. So now that being said, when we step back and think about the spirit of Kantianism, he would certainly have been strongly in favor of, of a member of an organization doing something, taking steps to end wrongdoing in that, in that organization. So what might a Kantian say to the would-be whistleblower? Um, first of all, uh, the Kantian might say, you should take all internal steps that you can to put an end to, to this um, wrong behavior, which is potentially causing harm. Um, a Kantian might also have some advice for us. Don't promise, excuse me, don't promise to maintain strict confidentiality in, um, in an organization which is doing work that could have a significant impact on the, the lives or health of the public. He might say, um, don't sign on with an organization that doesn't have special protections for whistleblowers written into their policy manual. Nowadays, many organizations do have protections like that in place. Many professional organizations um, recommend protections for whistleblowers and there are federal laws around it. So um, with, uh, with these kinds of safeguards in place, um, if the promise that I'm making to my colleagues and, and my employer is one that has that uh, limitation to it, which stipulates that I am free to um, blow the whistle when necessary, um, that's going to work fine for Kant, and his system will be able to explain why we should always disclose information which is necessary to keep the public safe from harm. In this really brief analysis that I'm doing here in this lecture, the perspective on whistleblowing uh, from social contract theory looks a lot like the perspective we got from Kantianism. Um, under social contract theory, the, um, the conflict between a would-be whistleblower's contractual obligations to their organization, um, which are derived from their employment contract, would be in conflict with the social contract, our agreement to each other to uphold certain moral norms. Um, and I think that the kind of solution that I 
that I, the solution to this conflict that I talked about for Kantianism works here as well. Um, our uh, federal laws include protection for whistleblowers. Many professional organizations have statements around that um, because they recognize that public disclosure of dangerous and wrongful behavior can only be um, healthy for a profession in the long run. <clears throat> and finally, um, many organizations have internal policies um, protecting a whistleblower and thus encouraging them to do the right thing. So with those things in place, these will resolve the, um, the conflict, any, any conflict between my employment contract and the social contract. Um, again, I think the, uh, the, the insight here is that um, when you sign on to work in an organization, um, it's good to look at their whistleblowing policy. It's, it's, um, it's, it's important to have that in place and for you to be aware of it so that you know that you're not stepping into a situation where you could potentially face a conflict between your duties to the employer and your, your duties to the public. Um, as professionals, your, your duty to serve the public using your professional skills and knowledge is a very serious ethical duty. As I see it, virtue ethics has the toughest time handling the conflicts that arise for the would-be whistleblower. Um, loyalty, trustworthiness, integrity, these are important virtues. And when someone is faced with the decision to blow the whistle or not, they are most likely faced with a conflict of loyalties. As a professional, it's so important that we show a loyalty to our colleagues and to an, or an organization that we're part of. Why would this be a virtue? Let's just briefly recall what makes a virtue a virtue. And um, Aristotle considers a character trait a virtue when that trait promotes the individual's thriving in life when the trait promotes the good life for that individual. And so, yes, loyalty to one's colleagues, to one's organization, would certainly be a virtue um, because loyalty <clears throat> to these parties can stand to um, improve my thriving. It can give me career stability, um, enjoyment at work social connections at work, which can lead to opportunities, um, not only for networking, but just for growing in my practice, um, whatever profession I'm practicing. There's so much um, benefit and good that someone can enjoy from practicing loyalty to, to colleagues and to the organizations that they're working for. Um, on the other hand, uh, professionals certainly do have an obligation to the public and to society in a broader way to help um, contribute to the thriving of our society through practicing their profession. And so that gives them um, call to be trustworthy or loyal, so to speak, in their relationship to the general public and to disclose information to the public that the public needs to know about what an organization is doing. Um, so we can, um, you know, I'm really trying to talk about whistleblowing here without using the word duty because duty is not a virtue ethics concept. Um, but a virtue ethicist will think in terms of virtues such as loyalty or trustworthiness. Um, the, the whistleblower faces conflicting loyalties and, um, you know, uh, the theory does give us a way to resolve this conflict. We should think rationally about the, um, the likely outcomes for, um, for us if we blow the whistle or do not. How will that action 
impact um, my life and the fulfillment that I get from the various parts of my life. Um, so here it's important to talk about retaliation because uh, even though there are laws and often internal policies in place to protect a whistleblower from retaliation, um, there are just so many reasons why whistleblowers in reality still do face painful retaliation and um, their actions can have really long-term effects. Um, sometimes less so, sometimes more so, but uh, someone who was a, a, um, an adherent of virtue ethics and wanted to use virtue ethics to navigate a, a tricky situation in which they're asking whether they should blow the whistle would have to think about retaliation um, and the, the impact of this action on themselves. So <clears throat> um, ultimately, the kind of advice that a virtue ethicist is going to give this person will be a lot like the kind of advice they give everybody facing a difficult moral question. Learn as much as you can about the scenario. Examine it in its complexities. Think about how your potential actions are going to shape your character. Who will you make yourself into if you blow the whistle versus if you remain quiet? Um, how will these, these actions affect your life in various areas, your career, your health, your family life, your relationship in your community, and so on. Um, and these are really big questions. So uh, virtue, virtue ethics is also by and large a situationalist ethics, which requires that we make moral decisions on a case-by-case -case basis um, that doesn't mean, of course, that we are inventing new virtues every day and switching them up constantly. We still want to be consistent in building virtues over time. But what it means is that in making a moral decision, we inevitably have to be very sensitive to the many complexities and nuances of that situation. So in, in some cases, using virtue ethics, we're going to decide that whistleblowing would be the wrong thing to do. And um, I think it's very interesting to consider that given the current cultural climate, um, which tends to celebrate whistleblowing. But according to um, virtue ethics, if the, um, if the consequences of retaliation would be too detrimental for you, uh, and perhaps if your um, if you could easily remain quiet uh, and know that um, the people either wouldn't be harmed by what's going on or um, would only face a very slight risk, then I think that under virtue ethics we would say just keep mum. Um, however, and uh, it's just complicated, but um, the virtue... What if we're in a scenario where um, many people will uh, will be affected, but if uh, many people will be affected positively, if I blow the whistle, I, I know that something um, really bad and really harmful is going on. I'm in the position to step up and um, make a statement about that. Um, yet I know it will be very detrimental to me personally. Um, Aristotle has an interesting idea that when we do the right thing, when we exercise virtue, um, and we know we've done the right thing, we get a good feeling from that. So we get a form of happiness from that. Um, that's there, but it's not, uh, it's not clear in the end that he thinks we should sacrifice our lives um, in a scenario like this. I'm sorry, I can't give you the definitive virtue ethics answer, but there isn't one. Um, the theory will require a person to, um, apply 
virtue ethics decision making strategies on a case by case basis and put a lot of research and a lot of careful thought into it. Now, um, <clears throat> in the end, um, if we're applying virtue ethics, we're going to need to think um, not just about what we do, but how and why we do it. So um, someone who is going to blow the whistle over a relatively minor matter because they have resentment for their supervisor and they want to get back at them would certainly not be a virtuous thing to do. Um, because uh, virtue relates not only to what we do, but how and why we do it. So our internal states of motivation and attitude around the action really matter a lot. Um, someone applying virtue ethics is gonna, is gonna need to sort out not only the externals of the situation, but also um, internal to themselves. They're going to have to sort out a good motivation um, and do the whistleblowing with an appropriate attitude. And that's going to vary by the situation because, again, this is a situationalist theory. But attitudes like humility, um, gratitude, compassion, uh, kindness, those all might be appropriate for a whistleblower. Um, especially since uh, some whistleblowers are complicit in the wrongdoing. So um, in blowing the whistle, they may be admitting, hey, I did something wrong, and humility is the right way to do that. Um, compassion, I think, can be appropriate um, because, uh, of course, compassion for the, the public in helping to prevent harm to them, but also compassion for those who have done the wrong actions. Um, we may uh, have good reason to, to cultivate compassion for the wrongdoers. Why? Um, they may have been pressured into what they did, maybe internal pressures, external pressures. They may not have fully understood um, the ramifications. They... Um, Maybe, uh, you know, just showing us one of those, uh, those uh, enduring human traits, which is um, making mistakes to err is human. And we all, um, we all can do things which later we regret. So uh, just having some compassion for them, balancing that, of course, with perhaps uh, courage as a virtue, righteousness, and perseverance.